Welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Anderson, and this is Webinar on Wednesday with Destinations Together. As always, a warm welcome to our Zoom listeners and Cruise Line executives that are tuning in. With all of the encouraging news about vaccinations, discussing travel and cruise tourism is getting exciting and real. Welcome to the third session of our Sustainable Tourism Webinar Series, hosted with the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, GSTC. In the first session, Randy Durbin, CEO of GSTC, set the stage by explaining GSTC's mission, which is underscored by the fact that the cruise industry is increasingly focused on a sustainable tourism agenda for both future shipboard operations and in the destinations they visit around the world. The second session of the series focused on the pathway tour operators can take to become GSTC certified. Today's session is focused on destination stewardship and community tourism. We are talking about much more than the stones and bones of the past. Communities and their cultural sites are invaluable, unique, and irreplaceable. So a community must make the effort to preserve these important sites and educate those that visit. Many communi communities are heavily impacted by hit and run tourism. This occurs when tourists visit a specific heritage site or community for only a brief amount of time and then move on. But there is invisible impact on the community from their visit and typically no money is left behind. This is a major problem for destinations globally. So how do destinations work together to maintain and enhance the cultural, environmental, and aesthetics of the community? We'll dive into this question as we focus on destination stewardship and learn how community tourism can drive success and foster a living balance in the destination. Today's presentation is hosted by Destinations Together, which is an open platform of relevant information and collaboration to support the tourism industry. It is designed to help everyone connect, collaborate, and find solutions to bridge the gap until cruise ships and tourism return to your region. There's a lot to unpack in this destinations focused session. I'll turn this over to Larry to share some important information and then introduce our guest speakers for today's Destinations Together in our webinar on Wednesday. Larry? Hey, thanks, Tom. First off, we would like to recognize our participants from our February 10th webinar featuring Tour Operator Sustainability and GSTC Certification with Travel Life. Now, Kirsters, General Manager of Travel Life for Tour Operators, Gert de Wolf of Debuck Travel from Belgium, Trina Molina of Aviamar in Mexico, and Emma Bell of ID Tours in New Zealand. We really appreciate their participation and please check out our website for their presentations. All of our webinars are available to you free on our website, www.destinationstogether.com, since April 2020, when Tom and I started our webinars. Check them out and don't hesitate to socialize the website uh, with others. Everybody is welcome. Before we begin, let me remind you of a few important housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar and we'll upload it to our website in the next few days. There is a Q&A tab below on your screen. We look forward to getting your questions to pass on to our guest speakers. We encourage you all to vote on questions listed in the Q&A to help ensure we include the most important ones. Please remember we and our guests are only providing our opinions and possible sources for further information. Today marks our third out of four in a series of showcasing sustainable tourism as Tom mentioned. Please refer to our website for further details on the upcoming webinars in this series and of course, we will be sending out email reminders as well as a social media post. We are thankful to all of those joining today from around the globe. If it is your first time, we are so happy to have you join us. And if you are returning and have been with us a long time, we appreciate your continued support. Today's webinar is about destination stewardship and sustainability. Kathleen, please join me as I provide a quick introduction. Kathleen Pittman, President of Agile Community Partners and a core member of the GSTC team will share how local communities, government agencies, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, 
the tourism and the tourism uh, industry can form meaningful partnerships to develop and manage the tourism sustainability. Kathleen will introduce Deanne Taylor Williams, Assistant Permanent Secretary of the St. Kitts Ministry of Tourism, who will provide a firsthand account of how St. Kitts' ongoing sustainable tourism journey. After Kathleen and Kathleen's and Diane Hill presentations, then Tom will join us to introduce Jamie Sweeting, President of Planetera, who will share how his nonprofit organization works with the local population to develop compelling tourism experiences. Kathleen, I welcome you to the webinar today. With that introduction, I turn the webinar over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My company is Agile Community Partners, and I am a core member of the GSTC team as well and have been for 10 years. We all know that travel and tourism, of course, creates tremendous benefits for everybody involved, including host communities. But when managed poorly or when unmanaged, can create strain and stress on destination infrastructure and natural resources, residents' experience, and the visitor experience. So destination stewardship is about bringing together government, companies, and community groups in a collaborative approach to protect destinations, not just in environmental terms, but also protecting economic benefits for local communities, culture and heritage, and residents' way of life, and the aesthetic of the places we love. This all sounds great, but how do we do this? So GSTC is the standard setting body, which sets minimum recommended practices and policies to guide sustainable development of tourism and management of tourism in destinations. We also have a standard for hotels, of course, and for tour operators. In the case of managing destinations though, which is complex due to the great number of organizations across sectors uh, that need to be collaborating, the key is getting all the different parties together at the table on the same page and setting up those collaboration mechanisms. We have seen great progress in communities that get this right. Um, so GSTC and my company work with companies and governments to form meaningful partnerships involving their stakeholders and suppliers working together systematically to adopt these good practices. GSTC is working with communities across the globe. This is just a small sample of them. You may see your community here. Um, we provide destination sustainability assessments of communities to show destinations where they are performing well and where they face sustainability risks uh, in tourism management. The destination assessment process brings these stakeholders to the table from the various groups that really should be working closely together to better manage tourism um, and to develop action plans to address the risks identified in their destination assessment. We get everybody at the same table. Um, this is an example output from a destination assessment. This is Roatan. They had an assessment back in 2013. And you can really see that over the course of the last six or so years, as they've been working closely, collaboratively, and systematically to address the risks that, that had been identified in their follow-up assessment in 2019, you can really see um, they've made a lot of progress on the issues identified. Um, just some examples of some corporate partnerships for destination stewardship um, that we've embarked on. Royal Caribbean Cruises, um, through their collaboration with World Wildlife Fund, has committed to GSTC destination assessments and also to certification of their private destinations, Coco Key and Labadee. Um, Royal Caribbean has also sponsored over the last several years and in partnership with uh, several other organizations, um, destination assessments in several uh, Caribbean and Central American countries. And most recently, uh, they've sponsored destination assessments by GSTC in three communities that are often on the same cruise itinerary, Roatan, Cozumel, and Belize, so that these three communities could compare the results of their assessments and work on together the risk areas that they share um, for collaborative um, benefit for their communities and to, to save resources. Seeing the, the benefit of the GSTC destination assessment tool in cruise destinations that are experiencing stress, um, the Cruise Lines Indus International Association sponsored a GSTC destination assessment of Dubrovnik 
a couple of years ago um, at the end of 2019 and into 2020. And then now in the coming months, they're going to be sponsoring um, additional GSTC destination assessments to identify risk areas um, in two communities in Greece, Corfu and um, Heraklion. Just a quick look, um, I look forward to delving further into the results of these assessments and some of the initiatives that emerge from them um, that we see commonly in a, a follow-on session. But just in the interest of time, want to mention a few of the common themes that we often see come up in destinations reflecting the need for better stewardship. And um, you know, these, of course, when properly addressed, can benefit, of course, not just local residents, but also um, the visitor experience and, um, and you know, the companies that are, that are doing business and bringing visitors to the places that we love. Um, so one that we see commonly is the need to improve deeper partnerships with local communities, um, developing community-based tourism so that the local culture and heritage is better reflected and incorporated into the visitor experience through excursions, food and beverage, souvenirs, any touch points that the visitor may have. Um, we'll hear more about ways to approach this from Jamie Sweeting shortly. Um, we also see a great need for better visitor management, um, managing visitor numbers and flows at sites and attractions and also throughout destinations um, to prevent overcrowding and degradation that can happen at sites and attractions and within destinations, as well as to prevent alienation of local residents um, and several other types of initiatives that I, I look forward to going into later on. Um, one way that GSTC and, and my company supports communities is formation of local destination stewardship councils or organizations that bring government, businesses, uh, nonprofits and community groups together to take this coordinated approach, to get on the same page and um, really work together more closely than usual to, to plan and manage tourism. We have great case studies of these kinds of destination stewardship councils achieving positive results. Roatan, their improvement was, was one. Um, and you'll hear from another in just a moment, St. Kitts. Um, so in closing, I, I really want to encourage you, please let's get in touch if we're not already. Chances are GSTC is already partnering in your community in one form or another. And we'd love to plug you into that work and also learn about the challenges that you're facing in your community so that we can explore collaborative solutions. Um, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce my longtime client and uh, an early adopter destination of the GSTC criteria for destinations, St. Kitts. Um, Ms. Dianeal Taylor-Williams is the Assistant Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Tourism of St. Kitts uh, since 2007. She is also the focal point of destination, the Destination Stewardship Council of St. Kitts, the St. Kitts Sustainable Destination Council, or SDC, which has been recognized with Caribbean Tourism Organization, World Travel and Tourism Council awards, for their destination stewardship accomplishments. Dianeal is currently the chair of, um, St. Kitts is the chair and Dianeal is the representative on the Association of Caribbean States Special Committee on Sustainable Tourism. And um, Dianeal, you merit a much lengthier introduction for all of your accomplishments and, and lengthy uh, institutional roles, but in the interest of time, I'll just hand the mic over to you. Good day, everyone. I hope you're hearing me. Yes, we can hear you. All good. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to share in this event. I will be sharing on this Thank It Sustainable Destination Council. Now, how did we come about this destination council? As Kathleen indicated, we were one of the early adopters of the GSTC destination criteria. We actually had an, our assessment done in 2012, and we were sponsored by Royal Caribbean Cruises, and we wanted to look at um, our performance against the criteria. Based on the recommendations that came out of the assessment, 
we created um, the Destination Council, and it was intended to improve coordination among government, private sector, and across government agencies on matters relating to the management of tourism in our destination. However, we didn't just um, call it a sustainable tourism agency as that would give the impression that we are only focused on tourism and visitors. We looked at it as a sustainable destination management council. And so we formed the council in 2013. It is a cross sector council, which is focused on the good management of our destination. And it is made up of government, private sector, local NGOs and other stakeholders within the destination. We have representatives from various agencies, such as the Department of Culture, Skellig, which is our electricity company, the St. Kitts Sea Turtle Monitoring Network, the St. Kitts um, National Trust. We have Junior Achievers St. Kitts. We have the Department of Marine Resources. We have our destination management organization, which is the St. Kitts Tourism Authority. These are just some of the member agencies and we meet monthly to share information about the age, the initiatives um, being undertaken by our various agencies so that we can make sure that we can collaborate and work in the same direction, doing so efficiently. This has been really useful for us in terms of networking and just to get a better understanding of what is happening in other departments. This also provides us with a central point of contact for businesses or partners who want to be able to reach our members in one space, making for widespread information sharing and coordination. Now, what is our mandate? Now, the Sankey Sustainable Destination Council, in addition to information sharing with our members, we also manage action projects which address destination stewardship issues. We are also focused on functional partnerships. As a matter of fact, our belief statement actually spells out the fact that we believe in functional partnerships and not just partnerships and not just having members or numbers of members. We are about taking action together. Even in the absence of funding, for our projects, we continue to come together so that we can work more effectively and efficiently. The motto of the SDC, the Sink is Sustainable Destination Council, is good for us, better for all. That is because our first aim is to make Sink it's a good place, a wonderful place for the residents to live. And by doing so, we add value and create a great place for persons to visit and to experience. For the next five years, we call it our vision 2025. We have created a vision and we say that we want to see a St. Kitts where community members actively contribute to destination health while promoting our island's distinctive identity. Some of the activities that we've undertaken to date include training of our tourism stakeholders in destination stewardship. And so every year we have what we call our destination guardian training, which is focused on our, mainly on our public sector stakeholders, but we also include other tourism businesses. We also have our sustainable tourism enterprises training. We have training, special training for tour guides um, in various communities because we also focus on community tourism. We also pay special attention to the youth because if this um, council is gonna carry on into the future, we have to give our attention to our young people. And so tourism education starts as young as our primary or elementary schools. And it is about raising awareness about the value that tourism brings to our communities. We also have training for other individuals because we want to emphasize the importance of sustainability, sustainability to our country, 
especially since we are a small island developing state. We also focus on increasing community benefits. Community tourism development, um, in doing so, we work to develop new sites and attractions to create additional immersive experiences for our visitors and at the same time doing so to benefit the communities. This also relieves pressure from some of the more overcrowded uh, sites that are more well known, uh, for which visitors have already begun to start leaving negative reviews. We also focus on historic site preservation so that we can add additional experiences that benefit the surrounding communities and again add diversity to the guest experience of our destination. We support local small businesses, especially our artisans who create locally made souvenirs and food and beverage. This is mainly done through several projects and we receive support for these initiatives. We've also had resident perception surveys. We did our first one in 2017 and we use this to gauge local attitudes about tourism so that we can improve the perception of tourism and broaden the benefits of tourism to our people. We are about to conduct another resident perception survey. And interestingly, at first we thought that we might skip this year, bearing in mind the current situation resulting from the global pandemic. But in the Sustainable Destination Council, we decided we should go ahead and conduct the survey this year because we believe that having the survey at this time would prove or show people will now have a greater appreciation for tourism, especially in its absence. And people who do not consider themselves a part of the tourism industry will begin to see how connected we all are through tourism and the benefits that tourism brings to our economy. We also engage our stakeholders in destination stewardship in various ways. One of the ways we, we do this is through the creation of the Heart of St. Kitts Sustainability Charter. And this is done to encourage businesses to commit to adopting sustainability practices. As a matter of fact, we've recently done a revision of the sustainability charter, which was originally launched in 2016. We have now relaunched the sustainability charter, having taken into account the, the global pandemic situation and prefer, preparing for any future similar eventualities. We also engage residents in environmental stewardship and waste management issues to avoid litter and to clean up our beaches and communities. We have an initiative which we call Plastic Free St. Kitts Nevis, which began in 2017 as just Plastic Free July, where we joined the global Plastic Free July movement. This has now evolved into a new project which begins as part of our vision 2025 and is now called Plastic Be Gone. And we are hoping to encourage to reduce plastic consumption and, and pollution, especially single-use plastics. Now, during the assessment by GSTC in 2012, one of the things that was noted was the fact that we did not have a mechanism in place for visitors who wanted to give back to the community. And as a result of this, the Destination Council came up with the idea that we should create a travel philanthropy uh, platform. And we've done so, we launched it in 2016. It is called the Heart of St. Kitts Foundation. And we believe that we, it is by no coincidence that we use the term heart, we use the word heart because we invite people to follow their heart to St. Kitts. But the issues such as these in terms of giving back our heart matters. We also acknowledge the fact that the lifeblood 
comes from the heart. And so tourism has been the lifeblood of the economy of St. Kitts and Nevis. But we believe through strategic partnerships, these um, situations can give life to our economy. And with that said, I would like to thank you for listening to my presentation. And I look forward to your questions. And in the event that you're unable to ask your question today, feel free to email us um, at iasdmc.sk at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane Neal and Kathleen. That was excellent and very, very informative. It's wonderful to see destination stewardship and the assessments in action around the world. And also great to learn about the functional and meaningful efforts being made in St. Kitts. The Caribbean thanks you. Well done. Next up is Jamie Sweeting. Jamie, please join me on the screen. There he is. Uh, Jamie has spent the last 25 years working in tourism, conservation, development, and business management. Prior to joining Planetaria, Jamie was Global Chief Environmental Officer at Royal Caribbean Cruises and headed up the travel industry program at the Center for Environmental Leadership at Conservation International. Jamie's passionate about Planetaria because of its mission, which leverages tourism to improve the lives of some of the most under-resourced people on this planet, especially marginalized women, disadvantaged youth, and rural as well as indigenous communities. During this portion of the session, Jamie will help us see our destinations through the community tourism lens. Jamie, welcome and thank you for being here today. Great to see you again, Tom. Well, it's um, this, I, this has been such a great uh, uh, series. I'm really excited about it, but let's, let's dive in uh, to, to Planetaria. Planetaria's goal is, as I understand it, is to alleviate poverty through community tourism. How do you define community tourism and what exactly does it mean to you? Well, I think to me, the essence of community tourism is, is tourism experiences that are uh, owned, run and led uh, by community members. Um, uh, I think at it, its very best community tourism reaches out and uplifts uh, the most marginalized and, and underserved in our communities. Um, and often it, it, it's, it's an area of tourism that's, you know, people focus of, oh, that only happens in the developing world. But, uh, you know, through my work with Planetera, we've, we've learned that, the, that there are underserved and marginalized communities in every country in the world. Um, uh, I'm based here in the United States and certainly, you know, our indigenous people um, uh, are, are not often given the opportunities that, that others are. And, and so that's really... For me, community tourism is, is really about, you know, how can we provide extraordinary experiences for, for travelers while at the same time lifting up uh, people in the communities, the host communities that are, that are uh, willing to have us come and visit them. Well, when you talk about these extraordinary experiences, when I comb over your website, there's over 70 projects that I saw from around the globe. And I assume these photos that we're seeing here as well are, are depicting those projects. Um, what are a couple of the most impactful community tourism projects that you and your team have worked on? Well, yeah, just to, to point out, uh, Tom and I decided it would be more interesting to look at some beautiful pictures than to look at us. So um, <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully we can be a bit of a voiceover um, and, and you might get a little bit hungry watching some of these images, but uh, I, I, you know, we're now working with over 150 communities in, in 65 plus countries around the world. So this is a, a truly uh, global effort to bring uh, community tourism uh, experiences to the marketplace. Um, I, I thought I'd, I'd just talk about three um, and I'm not going to say that they're the best. I'm just going to say that they're three that I thought would resonate with, with a cruise audience. Um, uh, the first one is in Barcelona. Um, and uh, it's a, an initiative called Mescladis, um, and it's a youth training uh, program that provides a culinary experience for travelers to um, work with uh, local youth and, um, uh, and also migrant youth um, to 
uh, learn how to cook a, a fusion meal. So what they've done, and I think this is really creative, is that they've taken traditional uh, Spanish uh, recipes uh, and dishes and they have fused them with uh, the cultures of, of the immigrant populations that are, are part of the program. And uh, travelers are allowed to, to basically interact with the youth and learn how to create these um, these, these magnificent meals together. So it's a cultural experience, it's a culinary experience, um, and it's, it's a deliciously yummy experience. Um, so that would be one example. Another would be uh, a partner of ours called Dacia in, in Dubrovnik. Um, we, we just heard a little bit from Kathleen of the work that GSTC has been doing with, with Clear in Dubrovnik. Um, uh, Daisha's um, head office is, is in the old town of Dubrovnik. Um, it is a women's empowerment nonprofit that works all the way across Croatia to um, work with uh, women uh, handicrafts and, and develop um, uh, souvenirs um, from uh, women's group throughout, groups throughout Croatia. Uh, and travelers can go and, and visit the head office, go to the shop, uh, interact with some of the women that make these these handicrafts and and buy souvenirs that are actually you know authentically made um, in villages throughout the the destination. Um, another example uh, would be in Belize uh, in Kikorka. Uh, we work um, in partnership with uh, the high school called Ocean Academy. Um, mm -hmm. A real challenge on Kikorka was that for many years. They didn't have a high school. There's a picture actually of, of this project. Um, uh, and, and most of the youth uh, either didn't go on to high school or they had to leave and go to the mainland and stay with family or friends on the mainland to get uh, a high school education. And um, the Ocean Academy uh, is, is a, a creative uh, school um, that, that provides a, a secondary education, but um, it's a very practical education. They have hospitality training for uh, 17 and 18 year olds. Um, and we've partnered with them to create this bike with purpose experience where it's youth led tours that give you a, a, a bicycle tour of, of the island. Um, and you get to see the island from the point of view of, of, of a youth member. Uh, many of whom were born and brought up in the island. So you get a completely different experience. You know, you still get plenty of time to go and enjoy the beach and, and go shopping and, and eat great food, but you also uh, get to see uh, the island through the eyes of, of a native islander. So that's just three different ex examples. Uh, we work across the board through meals, transport, handicrafts, tour experiences and accommodations. Uh, obviously, for the cruise sector, uh, that's more focused on meals, handicrafts, and, and tour experiences. Well, the diversity is is really incredible, and 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 nicely depicted in those three in those three uh, examples that you had there. For those of us in the travel industry, um, we've been struggling to accomplish meaningful things during this COVID-induced uh, travel shutdown. Can you uh, explain Planetaria's pandemic initiative called? turn travel into impact from home? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, really uh, it was about a week from now, a year ago, um, we uh, were sort of busily uh, developing more of these experiences and bringing them to market with our you know, market partner, uh, tour operator partners. And then suddenly, you know, the world started closing down and shutting down. And we realized that, that we were a sum of all of our parts. And at the time, that was 85 communities in, in 54 different countries. Um, and uh, we went out to those, those partners and said, well, what do you need? I mean, suddenly, you know, global tourism is no longer a thing. So uh, and, and the overwhelming response from those partners was two things. One, some of them needed some immediate help um, in terms of you know, they had zero revenue coming in overnight and this was completely unplanned for. And so, you know, there was some, you know, fairly dire situations of, uh, of people needing, uh, you know, basic needs. They needed uh, food, they needed clean water, they needed medicine. So, so we deployed 
uh, a, a sort of an emergency response um, uh, and, and sent out grants and food packages and, and medical packages. Um, but mostly, you know, our, our relationship with these communities has been based on trade and not aid. Um, uh, they, these are communities that want a, a hand up, not necessarily a hand out. Um, uh, you know, and so all of them came back and said, help us um, to, to pivot. I mean, that was the, the one of the big words of, of 2020 um, was how do they adjust to these new circumstances? So we did a lot of work working with communities to retool and relook at, at how they could reimagine their experiences for local audiences. Uh, we created an online shop at, 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 um, on the planetera.org website, uh, which pushes you out to all of our partners that, that created shops with their, their handicrafts. Um, but really, for the vast majority of them, it's about how do we, how do we prepare for travel coming back again? Uh, and how can we be successful on the back end of this? So, so that's a great initiative, but where did all the dollars come from? From travelers, the vast majority, we had a, a few very generous uh, corporate and, uh, and individual donors, but the vast majority of it uh, came from travelers that had been to visit uh, our, our community partner projects. Um, uh, I, we've, we've had somewhere in the region of 700,000 travelers have been to visit uh, our projects when we started. We think now with our 150 plus communities, we're closer to a million people that have visited these programs. So this is not, you know, bespoke, um, you know, niche market tourism anymore. We're talking about, you know, seven figure visitor numbers to the these kinds of experiences. Um, and it was a call out to, to people that had been and had these extraordinary experiences uh, with some of these projects that, that felt that they wanted to give back to, to help those individuals and, and communities and families that they'd met in their travel experiences. And obviously they responded. So when um, I, I see you have a lot of key supporters, how critical are they to Planetera's success in terms of, of uh, sponsors or supporters? Or is it, is it as you were just mentioning, primarily uh, uh, previous visitors? And could cruise lines or tour operators eventually become sponsors or, or supporters? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's a combination of all of the above. Um, uh, I think, you know, when you get a, uh, a global brand uh, supporter, um, it, it lends credibility to you as an organization. So Deloitte has been a, 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 a partner and sponsor of ours for, for over six years now. Um, you know, obviously, you know, that shows some integrity of the organization that an organization like that would would put, you know, money into to, to us. But it's not just money. They've they've donated time of their staff, uh, volunteer hours to match them up with with a number of our, our our community partners to help them on business planning and financial management and accounting and things like that. So, um, uh, you know, our, our vision for this is is how do we take this this kind of experience to scale we we think that you know in a way we want to democratize community tourism uh we want any traveler that is going uh on their travels to 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 be able to access these kinds of uh experiences um you know as you said at the top of this tom i've been doing this a very long time and i think what what's so amazing about this work is that it, it's just better tourism it, it provides really special experiences uh, for those that are participating in it. Uh, it's not about charity, it's about commerce, um, but in a, in, in, a, in a trade, not aid sort of manner. Um, it's, an, it's, a, it's an equal exchange of, of, of ideas and experiences. Um, it benefits you as the traveler because you get a meaningful, authentic experience. Um, you get to meet uh, uh, the people that, that make up the, the, the heart of, of the destination, as Daniil would say. Um, and, and so, you know, that's really to us what it's all about is, is getting more people in, in what we hope will be a big tent. So sort of scaling it up. And today there are a lot of tour operators in, in our audience. How can cruise companies and shore excursion providers or tour operators go about integrating community tourism experiences into their product offer, offerings? 
where, how do they start? What's the- Yeah, I mean, you and I have chatted roadmap? about this many times over the years, Tom. I think it's a little daunting for, for, for folks, uh, you know, the, the Shorex teams in, in, in the cruise lines and, and indeed Shore excursion providers. The, there's this misnomer of, of working with communities is, is difficult and challenging and, and, and not, you know, financially viable. Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, certainly there are some experiences that can be challenging, but I, you know, tell me what experiences in the workplace aren't challenging, particularly in the world we're living with right now. Um, uh, I think, you know, really it's about saying we want to build into our portfolio some of these kinds of experiences. Uh, it won't be for everybody um, and it doesn't need to be in every destination tomorrow, but it's a commitment to taking the time and effort to reach out, as I say, the, these are many of these communities and, and nonprofits that run these kinds of experiences aren't naturally coming into the market. They're not coming and knocking on your door. You actually have to go and look for them. Um, uh, uh, and in many cases, because they haven't got the confidence, they've been marginalized as a community before, um, that they're, they're scared, really. They don't think, oh, a cruise line doesn't want to bring their, their passengers to, to visit my community and have a, a lunch with our women's group. Um, but the reality is that, that actually, if you test that experience with the cruise passengers, that they would love to go and have those kinds of experiences. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of, first of all, saying that it's something you want to do and then looking for partners like Planetera who can help uh, with, with you know setting the stage for having those kinds of co co uh, conversations and within the destinations of course there's a lot of destinations listening as well what can destinations or tour operators or cruise lines do to support uh, community tourism where it exists today well I thought you I, I mean you just heard some wonderful examples from Diane Eel of, of what you know St. Saint, Saint has been doing and I can't tell you how much that warms my heart because I was part of some of those conversations a decade ago with with Minister Ricky Skerritt in, in 2010, 2011, uh, talking about how cruise lines need to do more for destinations. And that's when we at Royal Caribbean, um, you know, uh, partnered with the United Nations Foundation to, to, to fund the destination stewardship work of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. So I think this is a long time coming. And, and I think that destinations can help with what, what we call the enabling environment. How do they, um, try to, to encourage communities to, to create these kinds of experiences and products? How do they uh, promote them, um, work in concert with the shore excursion providers uh, and the cruise lines to, 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 to help uh, promote these in the marketplace so it, it becomes easier uh, and, and the, you know, there's less of a barrier for the cruise lines to invest money up front if, if, the, if the destination is supporting at the same time so it becomes a a collaborative effort with shared risk and, and shared uh, expense. Um, uh, but the nice thing is, is that, that, that many of these things don't need to cost a lot of money. Um, you know, the average uh, Planetera project over the seven years that I've been there uh, is somewhere between 15 and $20,000 um, to bring to market. Uh, and those are, those are new products. And, uh, you know, for existing products, it's, it's much less money. It's, it's a matter of you know, just stewarding those relationships and, and fostering a, a trusting dialogue between the community uh, and the, the shore excursion provider and the cruise line. Well, excellent. It's, it's nice to see that the collaborative effect is, uh, it sounds like that's even more viable uh, than the dollars. One last question before we move to a, uh, the Q&A session with the full panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. In your experience, what kind of impact does the community tourism have for the communities, people, and families in the destinations? I, I think, Tom, this is why I'm in this work. It's literally life-changing, um, uh, and, and in some cases, life-saving. Um, uh, and, and I think that's the extraordinary power uh, of global travel. Um, and, and it's been so painful to, to, to see it, you know, largely put on hold for a year. We, we've really seen you know, with it missing, uh, how many communities are struggling. Um, but it, it's about empowerment. It's about enrichment. It's about, um, you know, 70 plus percent of our, our community partners are, are owned and run by women. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, we're about to have International Women's Day. It's, it's Women's uh, Month in the United States. I, 
I, I think you know so much of this is about empowerment and and uplifting uh, both the, the the communities, but also the the, the the traveler experience. Excellent. Well, Jamie, thank you for providing the perspective on this topic and helping to see and understand community tourism uh, more clearly. Larry. Yeah, we'd like to uh, one thank you to to, to, to Jamie, and Kathleen, and, and Neil. Uh, for, for your presentations, really appreciate it. We do want to uh, open up a poll um, before we get into the Q and A. So I'm going to open that up, and then Tom, I will let you take it over for uh, Q and A questions. Everybody okay. see it? You see the poll? Yeah, I, I saw the poll come up. Super. And then uh, Kathleen and uh, and Dianeel, if you want to pop back on, um, this this question is from Ambra. Have you considered a mentorship program where tourism professionals can share knowledge with youth, for example? And that, I, I don't know, Kathleen or, or Diane Neal, maybe that's that uh, you want to take that one? With respect to the men sharing mentorship, the mentorship program with the youth, um, we do it not directly. Um, by titling it a mentorship program, but we have, um, for example, when we go into the schools, it's not just the primary school level, uh, we go into the high schools as well, we work with the young people there, we also work with the young people at the uh, tertiary college that we have here, those who are pursuing hospitality studies, um, we work along with them, wherever we get the opportunity to do so. Um, we find ways of reaching out to our young people. But I take on board what is said, and maybe we can look at creating a formal mentorship program through the SDC, bearing in mind that the SDC is not just focused on tourism. It's about destination management, and our members are not all from a tourism background. But if we each do what we do um, in our different areas, well than tourism benefits. So I think maybe that's the angle that we, we can take so that we can also get our young people to appreciate that tourism is just not about the Ministry of Tourism and the Tourism Authority, but each of us, wherever we find ourselves, whether we are working in electricity, we are in banking, it all comes back to tourism. And I believe the, the Destination Council gives us a very good opportunity to do that. No, and, and again, I get, it really goes back to, I think, what Jamie was saying is this sort of collaborative community effort that it's, you know, we, we all have a stake in this. Um, another question from uh, Jolina. What are the challenges on focusing the community-based tourism, especially during a pandemic? How do you lift and adjust such that CBT needs contact and interacting with people? Uh, CBT meaning community-based tourism. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can start with that, Tom. I, I, the, the challenges are immense. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, we're trying to reach out and realize that, you know, as, as an organization that's been working in this area for 17 years, um, we have a lot to offer uh, many communities around the world that, that are struggling. Um, and, you know, through our experience of working with our, our 100 plus community partners through their transition, um, you know, COVID became a, a part of our everyday lexicon in January last year. Uh, we have a community partner um, in uh, in Yangshuo in China who was closed down by the uh, the, the Chinese lockdown on the 11th of, uh, of January. So uh, we had projects in Italy so um, that were affected in in February. So you know we we saw some of this coming. I don't think any of us really saw what happened, but. A lot of what we've been trying to do is, is provide uh, tr online training materials and, and capacity building, uh, networking, uh, facilitating exchange uh, between communities um, so that they can learn from each other, so they can realize that, that they're not struggling alone, that there are others all over the world that, that are facing the same challenges that, that they have. Very practically, um, you know, we coined the phrase communityify. We take uh, materials that are developed for professional audiences, uh, such as the World Travel and Tourism Council and the Adventure Travel and Trade Associations work on uh, 
uh, COVID response um, uh, and health and safety guidelines for, for how do you run a COVID safe experience. And we translated that into language um, uh, and, and materials uh, that are accessible to our audience. A lot of our, our, uh, our partners you know, uh, haven't completed a secondary education. Many of them left school at 11 or 12 years old um, uh, uh, and, and have limited access to the internet and, and limited uh, access to, to video. So you know, taking you know, webinars like this and then translating them uh, into voice uh, uh, files so that they can be accessed um, uh, with, with less uh, uh, kilobytes or megabytes download for a rural community, for example. This is sort of a follow on question from Jill. Uh, what advice do you have with regards to these kind of community tourism products and balancing, you know what I'm gonna say, and balancing insurance requirements? you know, sort of bringing it back to the, the challenges of everyday life. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, you know, I have the benefit of having, you know, been in the cruise industry and worked with the cruise industry for a dozen years, um, uh, been at Royal Caribbean for five years. I, I'm intimately familiar with, with how the system works. Um, I, I think the way that we've worked as Planetera is that you work with the system, not against the system. Uh, I, I think what you've seen in, in prior examples of the cruise lines trying to do this is getting very involved in voluntourism and, and those kinds of activities. That, that's not what we're suggesting. We're suggesting that you, with, you work with and through the existing marketplace, and that is through um, uh, shore excursion providers that have the uh, you know, insurance bonds, uh, be it with uh, the FCCA or, or um, other agencies um, and do the work with and through uh, your existing supply chain. Um, don't try and you know, uh, do this directly with the communities. I, I don't think that that's gonna work for the community. I don't think it's gonna work for the cruise lines. Um, and I think there's an extraordinary role that shore excursions uh, providers can play because the vast majority of shore excursion providers live and work in the communities and destinations um, that, that they operate in. And so they're already much more attuned to those local nuances than than than, than, uh, than the foreign cruise lines are. Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's a lot of uh, nuance, I think, to this side of the business, uh, Jamie, and, and creating these tours. Um, and uh, everybody, you can see it on the poll there, so please answer the poll. Um, but uh, both Jamie and Kathleen are very happy and willing to to provide a more in-depth workshop in each of these two specific areas. So we can dig down a little bit deeper and really focus in on some of these uh, details. Uh, so we can really kind of put the entire puzzle together and, and see what a roadmap might look like to, um, to destination stewardship or to building some of these uh, community tours. So, so please answer the poll accordingly because we're very, very happy to to have this as a next step. Um, Kathleen, one question I had, what, what are the greatest, it's probably Kathleen and, and uh, Diane Neal, what are the greatest challenges you faced in creating the Destination Stewardship Council? Were there, were there challenges sort of within the destination itself? I will defer to Diane Neal to answer that uh, most directly. <laughs> and then maybe I could fill in with, with some examples from other places too. I think one of the challenges we faced was um, getting buy-in. Uh, we, we knew that there was a need for something, for a mechanism, for a coordination mechanism, um, but getting people to see how they fit in. And you would notice, I think I mentioned it in my presentation, we specifically do not call our council a sustainable tourism council. We call it a sustainable destination um, council because we want people to understand that all of us have a part to play in it. And we wanted people to buy into the whole idea. When we first began, we had a few agencies um, who came on board immediately, having seen and heard the results of the assessment, the destination criteria. But then other persons came on board after they began to see what we were doing. In terms of the structure, the setup, um, that was another challenge, um, but over time, it was understood. Uh, we still have a little challenge, and I think someone asked the question about funding. For example, whereas the Ministry of Tourism 
would set aside uh, a portion of the budget for the projects to be undertaken. Some of the other agencies do not specifically do that, although we do receive some in-kind contributions and we always accept that as well as time because time has a value and people are putting in time to do the work that we are doing. But we would like to reach the point where people understand that we all have to commit to this and we are continuing to work at it and we are seeing results. We are having more and more like-minded persons um, who are showing interest in being a part of what we are doing. We are beginning to see that we are becoming a movement and not just something static. So I believe that over time, it will change just like anything new. People tend, especially for us, I'm not sure if that's the case in other jurisdictions, we tend to have a wait and see attitude. If it's gonna do well, I'm gonna get on board. Um, <laughs> that's how it is, we know that's how it is. And so we continue to do things to show people um, that it means not only for the Ministry of Tourism, but as our tagline says, it's gonna be first good for us as residents and citizens and our visitors um, will receive the added value for, for it. Yeah, excellent, well said. Kathleen, any, any other thoughts on that? I would just echo, um, absolutely. I mean, Daniel, you've lived it and we see that same sort of dynamic in other places too. But, um, you know, during, it's interesting during the, the pandemic pause in tourism, we really have seen destinations approaching us for support, including in forming destination stewardship councils if they had previously heard about them through GSTC otherwise. Um, so it is it is something that I believe, as Diane had mentioned before, um, people are you know really feeling the importance of tourism even if they hadn't appreciated it fully before um, in their community. And, um, and so we, we have been pleased that in this, during this time, uh, we, we really are seeing uh, organizations, companies, destinations wanting to, to really get this right for the relaunch and, and revision, you know, how they, how they go about things and, and taking this time, like Jamie was saying, to undergo some online trainings with us. And, um, and we are, we are involved in, in actively in, in the Bahamas, for example, um, in working with uh, six of the communities there to, to stand up destination stewardship councils and seeing many of the same dynamics, but, um, but maybe with an even greater commitment now that, that tourism value in, in communities has really sort of been brought home. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's such an important topic. Um, we have covered a lot of time. We're basically out of time. We have covered uh, a tremendous amount of of, uh, with regards to this topic today. And I wanna thank uh, Kathleen, Jamie, Diane Neal. It was a great session today. Thank you for your presentations and the Q&A session. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks John for hosting this important subject and a uh, great pleasure to be with you all. And let's, Same here. Uh, th thank you, Diane Neal. And, and, and please uh, 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 express your interest uh, in, in some following on workshops because we're happy to put those together. I think they'd be super meaningful. We can get into to a lot more of this detail. Um, just to close out, our next webinar will be March 17th at 9 a.m. Miami time, Hotel Sustainability and the GSTC Standards. This session will complete our four-part series on sustainable tourism and focuses on contemporary approaches for more sustainable hotels. We'll consider the value of applying the GSTC criteria to the hotel industry. Randy Durbin, GSTC CEO, will lead this session along with Ian Corbett, TUI Group Sustainable Business Manager. This session will take us to the cutting edge of hotel sustainability. We look forward to seeing you there. Please visit our website, www.destinationstogether.com to see all of our past and future webinars. And please don't hesitate to share our website with anybody else. Uh, again, I wanna thank Kathleen, Jamie, and Diane Neal for being here with us today. And to our listeners, many thanks to you all for your continued support. Be strong, be safe. To all the listeners out there in Zoom, Thanks for your support and participation. Until next time, stay healthy and take care of each other. Thank you.
get left behind.